In the last video, we looked at one of the earliest semi-empirical approximations, so-called complete neglect of differential overlap theory. Now I'd like to start looking at uh, more modern semi-empirical approximations, although modern relative to CNDO, they certainly go back quite a ways at this stage, uh, up and come almost up to the present, I guess I would say, in terms of what constitutes semi-empirical molecular orbital theory. So I'll remind you that one deficiency we identified in CNDO was a lack of distinction in two electron repulsions. And I, I showed two examples. I'll address each of them, but in a sense they are addressed uh, differently depending on whether they're same atom repulsions that are being ignored, the distinction being ignored. And that was an example I gave you for methylene. Uh, and the other example that I no longer have from the last lecture involved the rotational uh, isomerism of hydrazine. So we'll, we'll consider a case that addresses that too. But let me begin with thinking about same atom electron-electron interactions. And how could I improve on the CNDO approximation in order to uh, lift this deficiency? So... Intermediate neglect of differential overlap, not complete anymore, but now intermediate, and hence INDO, adopts an approach uh, of relaxing the CNDO restriction in the following fashion. It says, I'm, I'm still going to use what looks like the CNDO approach, namely that the mu times nu times lambda times sigma is going to be uh, taken as the Kronecker delta is just killing things and then looking at mu mu lambda lambda. But that will only be true for mu and lambda on different atoms. So if mu and nu are on the same atom, then instead I am going to recognize that the interaction between electrons in s orbitals on the same atom is different than between an s and a p orbital and between a p orbital and another electron in the p orbital, between a p orbital and an electron in a different p orbital, that's what p prime means, and finally one of the possibilities is that mu is an s and nu is a p, so an sp sp integral takes on a certain value. So there are five unique possibilities, because symmetry of ps is the same as sp for example, so for these five unique ways of having an integral involving an s or a p orbital, and given that there are three different Cartesian p orbitals, I'm going to keep specific values stored. Uh, of course, if I were to go, by the way, to lower in the periodic table and include d functions, I would have to increase the number of orbitals here to recognize that I could have s's interacting with d's, p's with d's, d's with each other, sd's, pd's, both on one side. That would increase this number. But at least in the first two rows, I only need these five. And where might I get these five from? Well, fortunately, I, I actually know, for instance, what the singlet-triplet splitting is in methylene. And that might be taken as a measure of the difference in... Uh, electron interaction energies that I could use to get at these values. But even better, in some sense, is I have extensive tables of atomic spectroscopy. And so that is the energies of atoms when the electrons are in different orbitals, if you will. So that is a pretty sensitive measure of what the the orbital-orbital interactions are as you, you know, pump electron pump electrons from one orbital to another in an, in an atom, and you can really uh, explore what these values must be. And so that was what was used to uh, originally develop INDO methods. And INDO methods continue to be used uh, pretty successfully, even in 2013, for purposes of looking at spectroscopy, as a matter of fact. So to the extent that many spectroscopic transitions in molecules may be quite localized to individual atoms or very small groups of atoms, that really is what INDO is sensitive to by uh, having individual parameters for these various orbital interactions that were taken from atomic spectroscopy. Well, molecular spectroscopy is reasonably well reproduced. So not always, but uh, given the enormous speed with which these calculations can be undertaken, it can be a very useful first step to trying to understand molecular spectroscopy, particularly in extremely large molecules where the speed of the INDO method is a, a real benefit. 
However, in order to improve uh, still further and to approach the problem, for instance, of the hydrazine conformational isomerism, the next level of approximation that is usually invoked is the so-called neglect of diatomic differential overlap. And so that's abbreviated NDDO. And so what that means is it's only differential overlap between basis functions on two different atoms that will cause an electron repulsion integral to be zeroed out. So it's no longer, in the past, it was just plain old differential overlap in a lot of cases, right? If you didn't have the same basis function times itself, forget it, send it to zero. But now the Kronecker deltas that appear in this definition, they don't take basis functions as their indices. They take the atoms on which those basis functions reside as their indices. And so to make this notation clear, what it's saying is if mu and nu are on atoms A and X, and that's why there's a mu on A and a nu on X. Well, if atom A is not equal to atom X, then this is equal to zero, and I won't compute that integral. But if X is indeed equal to A, then I get a one from the Kronecker delta, and I keep going, and I ask, well, lambda is on atom B, and sigma is on atom Y. Are B and Y the same atom? If they are, then the Kronecker delta allows things to survive, and I will come up with a value for mu nu, lambda, and sigma. Uh, by, by a value. So I, I plug in my mu, nu, lambda, and sigma, and I need to figure out what, what do I do for that integral. Well, if not only is a equal to x and b equal to y, but they're all equal one to another, that is, this is a monatomic term, well, I'll do it just like I did for INDO. I still have exactly these integrals that describe my intra-atomic orbital-orbital interactions. But what do I do about the case where it's atom A and atom B? So this can be an S or a P orbital on atom A. This can be an S or a P orbital on atom A. This can be an S or a P orbital on atom B. And this can be an S or a P orbital on atom B as well. So I'll tell you that for those first and second row atoms, where any one of these can be an S or a P, there are exactly 100 unique ways to express those integrals by choosing different choices of s and p. And I offer that as a challenge, by the way. I suggest you try to prove to yourself, yes, indeed, there are 100 of those. And it's not that you have to write all, out all 100. It's a little more straightforward than that. But uh, you might sit back and take a piece of paper and think about that. It'd be a good exercise. But what I want to make clear for purposes of this lecture is you simply cannot go to any sort of large experimental database and somehow figure out what should I chisel into a stone for a number for that particular integral. But let's step back and think about what does that integral really measure. So it measures electron density on one atom interacting with electron density on another atom and what would the density look like when you take the product of the orbitals involved? So if I think about an s orbital times itself, for example, that's going to be a little sphere of electron density, and it's a certain distance away from whatever's going on in atom B. So to some extent, as I get far enough away, that little sphere of density just looks like a point charge that is uh, located at the nuclear position. As I get far enough away, I don't, I don't care that it's delocalized a bit in space around the atom. If I take an S times a P, what does that look like? Well, because the P has a phase and the S is always positive, for example, I will get more density, I'll get positive density below, I'll get negative density uh, above, it depends on which way the phase is pointing, that's just a convention. And so that looks a little bit like a dipole. I've got a change in sign. If I get far enough away from that, I see that change in sign. It looks like a dipole, a point dipole, again, at the nuclear position. And what if I have a P times a P? Well, if you work this out, it looks a bit like a quadrupole as you get far enough away. So for long distances, it is a good approximation to treat these electron repulsion integrals as classical 
repulsion integrals, or, or uh, uh, depending on the sign, actually, I guess they could in fact be uh, attractive, you would get uh, monopole-dipole interactions, dipole-dipole interactions, uh, quadrupole-dipole interactions, and so on, and you can compute those just from classical physics. There are nice classical equations for how these things interact as a function of distance. So the dipoles and the quadrupoles themselves are actually represented by little point charges which are taken to be a certain distance away from a nuclear position and the magnitude uh, is expressed based on the size of the Slater basis functions that are used in the semi-empirical model. Okay, and so that's a, a parameter in some sense as well that we use in the basis functions. Well, that takes care of two electron integrals. We now have a pretty quick way to compute them in any semi-empirical theory. So in CNDO, we just looked up numbers. In INDO, we just looked up numbers. In NDDO, we look up numbers on individual atoms. And when we consider two different atoms, we compute them using classical electrostatics. So we've broken the end of the fourth bottleneck. That's not a problem anymore. What about the one electron integrals? Well, I want to come back to the idea of diagonal versus non-diagonal terms. So think about the case where mu is equal to nu. Right? So here's my one electron integrals. And so I'm going to take the kinetic energy integral. And all I've done is I've replaced nu with mu. And this is a real physical integral. It says, what's the kinetic energy of my electron in my basis function? Maybe it's an s orbital. So what's the kinetic energy of the s electron? I'm going to break up this sum into two parts, one of these nuclei is the nucleus on which mu resides, and all the others aren't. So I've got the atomic number for the atom on which mu resides. So this is just the nuclear attraction of uh, an electron in mu to its own nucleus. And then meanwhile, it also has an attraction to all the other nuclei. Well, let's just think about that physically. What do I have here? I've got the kinetic energy of the electron in orbital mu and the attraction to the nucleus. I know what that is. That's the ionization potential of that electron. If I rip it away, I have uh, changed its kinetic energy, and I can put it at rest somewhere, and I've taken it away from its nucleus. So I can just replace these two one-electron integrals with a physical parameter, which ought to be just about the ionization potential of the electron in that basis function. Meanwhile, what about the attraction to all the other nuclei? Well, in the spirit of these uh, NDDO models, for example, an S times an S interacting with a point charge a distance away, that looks exactly like an S, I'm taking mu as an example being an S, it could also be a P, but on that other atom, K, which is not the same atom on which mu resides, S times S is a point charge. Right? That's how I'm treating it in the uh, nuclear repulsion integrals, so I treat it the same way in Calculating the nuclear uh, attraction, I give it a negative sign because it's an attraction, but this electron-electron repulsion integral should be the same as the electron-nuclear attraction integral. They're both point charge models and multiplied, of course, because the charge on the nucleus is not one like it is for an electron in an s orbital. So this I've already computed, presumably, and I just go grab it from wherever I was storing it, multiply times z, and poof, I've got the one electron components of the diagonal term. What's left, all that's left, is the off-diagonal term. So for the off-diagonal term, I will again kind of make this distinction uh, that there are two off-diagonal terms. Let's consider the case where mu is not equal to nu, so it is off-diagonal, but they're both on the same atom. So what about this uh, kinetic energy integral? Well, mu and nu, if they are different must be s and p orbitals for the first and second row, right? If it's an s and an s, or a p and a p, uh, that's a diagonal element. So if it's an s and a p, I will get by symmetry, s would be even, p would be odd, this operator is even, I'll be taking an integral over all space of uh, even times even times odd, so it'll be odd and it'll go to zero. Similarly, if I have a p and a different p, you can work that out, that goes to zero. Same for this function, this is an even function. If it's s, it's even. If it's p, it's odd. 
this must be zero by symmetry. So the only term that survives is this one. And again, it is the interaction of some density in a product of mu and nu with a point charge at a distance one over r away. And that's exactly what I compute when I compute this integral that survives in NDDO theory as though I'm computing an interaction with a product of s orbitals on position k. So this is also a very simplified term, and it uses things I've already computed when I did the electron repulsion integrals. Finally, the last thing I need to consider is an off-diagonal term, and this is just a typo. That should say mu not equal to nu, of course, because it's off-diagonal, but each on a different atom. And so I have uh, a good old friend in this case from Huckel theory. I'm going to take a resonance parameter, I'll call it at this stage. So in Huckel theory, we called it a resonance integral and we plugged in beta. Remember, it was a measure of the interaction between electrons and different centers, and that's what we're really trying to get at here. So I'm going to have to get these as pure parameters, just as I did in Huckel theory, for example. I uh, may invoke some sort of knowledge of rotational barriers, perhaps, but in any case, I look those up. And this is something I alluded to a couple of lectures ago. This is finally a place where you actually use the value of the overlap integral. Remember, in the secular determinant, we just took the overlap matrix to be the unit matrix to simplify that part of the calculation. But here, we really want the resonance integral to be invoked only when things are close together. So remember, in Huckel theory, the resonance integral was beta when they were nearest neighbors but it was zero if they were any further away. So using the overlap integral is a more smooth way, if you like. You don't have to talk about who's a neighbor and who's not a neighbor. You just are multiplying by a value that's going to go from a big number when things are close together to zero when things are very far apart. And moreover, to make life simple, you don't want to have to have a different beta value for every possible combination of uh, mu and nu on different atoms. That would be a pain. Instead, you take the average of beta values that are specific to the basis function in question. Okay, uh, and the basis function on the particular atom in this case. So that provides a means to insert into every single integral needed in the Fock matrix a number, essentially, that gets looked up, or in the case of a few of the electron repulsion integrals, a, uh, a value that's computed by simple electrostatics, and in a few cases, of course, you'll also need to compute the overlap matrix element, but that's done with Slater functions, and that's pretty easy. So in concluding this uh, lecture, I guess what I'd like you to think about is we've, we've gone through, and probably at what you regard as a somewhat high rate of speed, uh, the approach to simplify the Fock matrix elements, every single one of them, by just referring to tables of parameters for the most part and a few very simple calculations. So a good exercise would be to uh, try to jot down what are the parameters, and you're welcome, of course, to refer back in the videos, what sorts of parameters would it take to complete the stone tablet that defines an NDDO model? That is, what are the, you know, the names of variables to which we will assign numbers that we will go and look up when we need them? Okay, uh, the last lecture in this series, which will come uh, next, is uh, to try to bring us right up to the present and also to talk a little bit about the people who were involved in the history of semi-empirical theory because there's a few interesting stories there and chemists should always bear in mind their heritage. We'll see that next.